Welcome to the World Builders Anvil, episode 257. Make a slightly silly, silly, or very silly character. It's... Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place where we will prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm Jeffrey W. Ingram. And I'm Michael Miller. Let's sup from the Monk of Java. Welcome back. As always, I am Jeffrey Phillips Bong. Uh, and I would love to introduce myself, but as of recently, my walk has gotten terribly silly <laughs> and it takes me a long time to get anywhere. Mm. Yes. Uh, if, if you have not known today's topic, we're going to be talking about is it Kevin Phillips Bong, not Tarquin, Fim Tim, Bim Tim, Wim Tim, Tim Bus Stop. <laughs> Tang Fitang Ole Biscuit Barrel or Malcolm Peter Brian Telescope Adrian Umbrella Stand Jasper Wednesday. I- I'm not sure that Sto- 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 Gobbler John Raw Vegetable. Wee! <laughs> Arthur Norman Michael. I don't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Featherstone Smith Whistle. That's my best whistle. Northcott Edwards fires bang. Actually, I think fires was actually not part of the. I name. think I think that's a pistol <laughs> sound. Okay, I think that's enough failure. Though. Mason chuff 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 chuff. <laughs> Fra- Frampton Jones fruit bat. I love when they throw the fruit bat in there. Fruit bat Gilbert. Uh, we'll keep a welcome in the th- in the Williams. If I could walk that way, way J- Jenkins. <laughs> Tiger draws. All right, we're good. We're I think okay. we're good enough. <laughs> really enough failures here, but today we want to talk about silly characters using comedy and characters. And this is obviously not meant as a comedy writing episode. Uh, yeah, if anyone um, recognizes the ridiculousness we were just doing, if you don't, it's it's that's from a Monty Python. There will be a link in the show notes to uh, a Monty Python skit with we'll probably, say some silly characters. Probably a lot of Monty Python, and it's about and it's about uh, uh, the election night in Britain. Uh, so it's quite relevant to any political. Uh, season uh, uh, but yes uh, we're going to be talking about making silly characters uh, but you know the idea is it's it's for, it's it's to use in, in non-comedy writing so mm. um, uh, you know obviously fantasy or science fiction how do you create a character with comedy you know whether it's just sort of straight comedy over the top or 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 very silly comedy and the thing that's funny that I find about characters that have that effect. There are plenty Mm -hmm. of characters that have that effect that are not particularly silly in their own Mm -hmm. right. Like, you know, it just in the context of wherever they're at, they, you know, usually the thing is that they don't quite fit, Mm -hmm. you know, like whether or not it is something as simple as an incredibly serious situation. And you have a character who doesn't take, takes things Mm -hmm. very seriously in any other scenario, this character wouldn't, wouldn't stick out very much, but because He's not taking things too seriously, and it's a very grave moment. You laugh; it, it creates laughter. Well, I, I'm going to actually bring up a secret here, uh, which isn't so much of a secret. Uh, well, I've certainly actually, not. If you're going to bring it up, don't you sure you want don't want to keep the secret? Oh no, no you're just, supposed to keep secrets, secret Jeff. Uh, back in my college days, I, I did acting, and uh, I was acting. a comic Thank relief y'all. character in one of uh, the plays I was in, which was a high drama play called "Look Homeward Angel." In which case, uh, the person who was actually uh, uh, talking about video games, Jim Six, was actually the lead in that production. And uh, Not surprising. Jim is an incredible actor. Jim is an incredible actor. And I was the comedic relief. And the idea is, especially in high drama, you need moments of levity uh, to bring down sort of the building tension so people can build up even more tension and really get smacked in the face really good when mm-hmm. the... When, when the drama happens. Mm. And so I was one of those characters. I actually played uh, another one of our friends, the writer of Descriptor's mother. Uh, okay. So uh, Matt's... I was Matt, Matt Bannock's mother in the play, which his mom loved to death. <gasps> she loved. I might have seen this play. You might have seen this. And I ended up... Uh, it was a fun play. I, I actually kind of did a Monty Python hag, which annoyed the heck out of the director because he didn't want me to do it. But on... On, 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 on the night, night of... of 
production. I just went out. Like, <laughs> but I don't like spam. <laughs> um, oh, also, he, the, loved, the, he the, just laughed, laughed that one off. The pep, the um, pepper pots. <laughs> and uh, but uh, but you know, really, there there are a few things you really have to keep in mind when you're creating a you know a comedic character, and it's not about necessarily a joke delivered, even though there might be mm. jokes delivered. You know, timing is everything. Definitely. You know, it's you know, and, and and changing any of these things I'm about to tell you could shift it from comedic to sympathetic to to, tra- uh, to tragic. To tragic. Like so- sometimes, uh, just a little bit of delivery or timing change can make something go from a punchline to a severe <laughs> statement. Yeah. And I forget who said this, but someone said comedy lives just beyond drama. You know, so you know, if you if you do something to a point, it's drama. When you go a little further, you're into comedy. And that's one of the ways I, I kind of keep it in my head because I do think, you know, you need levity no matter what's going on because especially if it's an overwhelming scenario, people need a way to release. And, um, um, uh, you know, the people who are caught up in the actions and comedy is one of the ways that people do it. Um, presentation is very important too. the way you present something, the, the way you utilize it in action is very important. Uh, incongruity using something sort of like Michael was saying a second ago, kind of a little bit out of place, you know, sometimes in and of itself is just the comedy and, and, and can be enough if the timing and presentations there. And, you know, it's really important that when you're using comedy, you know, the people who are going to be receiving it because ultimately it's what they know. You could deliver a really funny thing. And if the people who hear you know, hear or read or see the comedy, don't know what you're talking about. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, it's not going to be funny. So you yeah, really, that, that definitely falls into real good comedy to me, really attacks what people know. It, it, uh, and part of that is very much know your audience. Yes. It, if you hang on for just a second, I would like to share something very special with the listeners. Mm, of course. Psst. You come say hello. Oh, on no, that's just for me. The video, the video won't be. Oh, she can't hear me. No, she can't hear you. <laughs> just say hi to our listeners. They've heard about you. Hi, listeners. That's my Ooh. wife. It's my wife, Sarah. She was just on her way out and she was near near where, where I am recording. <laughs> One of the two brains. You can brains say, you can say hello again. <laughs> Sarah also used to podcast, so but she's, she's not liking her hello right there. Oh, don't say that. oh what, they can hear you right now. <laughs> yeah, it can be, but it won't be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, honey. I love you. One of the two brains of the operation of the World Builders Anvil. The other one is actually downstairs watching my child. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. <clears throat> so um, what I was saying, uh, two, two things that I want to reflect on. Uh, knowing your audience and what you were saying are only slightly different things. Mm-hmm. Um, one is to know specifically who you're targeting. Another mm-hmm. is to be aware of what people are, are aware of. So mm-hmm. if you have a, a, an like, say you're dealing with a big political audience, then you can make political jokes. You can mm-hmm. you can talk about different political commentators, and they'll know who you're talking about. But if you were to go to like, you know, I don't know, a, uh, a Final Fantasy, you know, gathering, and then get all political, people might know, and some mm-hmm. people definitely would, but not everybody. You'd definitely be off the mark for some of that stuff. Oh, most definitely. You know, and sometimes you know it's like like. Python's a great example where a lot of times smaller jokes that sort of come at the end of skits or sometimes lead into skits or seem like a one-off line. You can tell their joke when you're listening as an American, but they're really sometimes internal jokes to Britain. Yeah, that's true. um, You know, like some of the names they make fun of and stuff like that are things you would only know probably if you were in Britain at the time. (laughs) Uh, So, and sometimes when they would do skits in different scenarios, they would actually change some of those jokes around to make them more relevant to where they were. Um, the the other thing I wanted to slide back on is, is the, the idea of breaking tension. Um, comedy, uh, especially to have like the right punch when you're working with um, drama, like it's one thing if you're watching a thing and it's just all jokes, 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 mm-hmm. right? But if you have a serious, and 
my thought is that most of our our listeners slash writers are writing serious fantasy mm -hmm. and they want to, you know, if they want a silly character, they have to understand that that character is going to be an effective means of of releasing tension as mm -hmm. long as you understand that. Like, mm -hmm. you, you, it might not, might not be that funny if you're just having this funny character do funny things in like your average scenario throughout the story. You know, mm -hmm. if they're, if they're shopping in the market and you just have them do something funny, it probably won't mean a whole lot or, or be as effective as what you're looking for versus you create tension, you mm -hmm. create a, a, a difficult sequence, you know, and then have him do a funny thing yeah. to, to turn that down, kind of, kind of break the levity. Like let's say you've got characters who, you know, have beef with each other, but they're forced mm -hmm. to be in the same group or, you know, old family members that, you know, haven't talked in a while. So now they're forced to do a task and there's tension. Mm. And then the silly character straight up points that out, you yeah. know, like there's a moment where they're go where they're going back and forth. And then the silly character goes, Oh, well, you know, and says something that points out the tension or tries to diffuse the tension. Yeah. And, and one of the things to keep in mind too, is don't get so worried on, on doing something you know, events wise at the, at an appropriate time. Um, it, because people who uh, will consume the fiction that you're making, there will inevitably be people like, well, you know, the character just seemed kind of inappropriate at the wrong times. Mm. And that kind of reminds me back in the U S right after nine 11, Gilbert Godfrey got in mm. trouble for making a, a joke about nine 11. And one of the great, things i heard someone i think it was Penn gillette was talking about this is like the problem you don't understand is people deal with tragedy in different ways mm -hmm. um and for comedians it's almost definitely comedy they use so they're going to make a joke about something because that helps them deal with the mm -hmm. stress of the situation and, and so and can we it, talk about uh, about that situation for just a moment because sure. i know a little bit a little bit about it i'm a huge fan of gilbert godfrey and um the thing that he he did is he he just wanted to be the first one to make a nine eleven joke. Mm -hmm. He made it. I mean, the whole bit is you know tragedy plus time equals comedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he was jumping the time gap mm -hmm. really early. Mm -hmm. And just as Jeff said, some people need to make fun of a given thing that's horrible so that they can take a little power away from it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I don't know if that's exactly what he was doing, but he did make the joke. But what it also leans into, he did it at a um, at a Friars event, and he got booed. People were not happy about it. Mm -hmm. And then, as a silly character to diffuse an incredibly tense scenario, he told the aristocrats. That was the same. That was the same event. Oh, that that, really that awesome. is one of the reasons that that is such a significant thing because from that that inspired the 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 documentary of the okay. Arist aristocrats and the whole the whole movie is if and it, I feel like I have to get into the aristocrats for a second here now to make to well I would just just sum it up. I, I mean, okay, so to sum up, if you're not familiar with the aristocrats, it's a joke. It's a comedian's joke, and by that I mean there are some things that people do in their given trade that is not for everybody else. It's for only for the people that are in the trade. The aristocrats joke is that joke for comedians. The point of the joke is not to make the joke super funny. It can be, and a lot of times it is. The point of the joke is to make it yours. You should tell that joke the way jazz musicians make music because mm. you they they don't just play a given song. They play it, they make it their own, they do solos that no one else could, could come up with on the fly but them because it's very personalized, and that's what the aristocrats mm -hmm. is. So he proceeded to make an incredibly... <laughs> lewd and 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 it's it's a very lewd joke to begin with the the intention of the joke is for it to be very vile and you know so that's what he did yes so the comedy was not in the punchline it was in the timing of presentation yes yeah <clears throat> um yeah yeah so i and you know and once again and and i i don't know where it is where you live uh but in modern day especially in america and i don't know about other western countries even uh Comedy tends to offend people because you are attacking things they know, and mm. it's not a very popular thing to do right now. Be forewarned. I would say don't let that stop you. Uh, but if you're not comfortable, that's fine too. I just you be warned that uh, a lot of comedians in this day and age are getting sort of gone after. In a way, it might be 
safer to do in the fantasy world. Um, but people will draw implications that aren't necessarily uh, real if you do. Uh, and you uh, make headlines. Now, um, let's talk about some basic comedy characters. And, and there are many sub-variants off of, I mean, way more than we could list here. There'll mm-hmm. be a link to uh, a TV Tropes uh, article that kind of goes into a whole bunch. But there, there were a couple I, I kind of want to talk about, which is, first off, The Rancher. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite types of comedians. Uh, Dennis Leary, to me, uh, at least in my age generation, is the personification of this uh, in, in his acting roles and in his comedy, his stand-up mm. comedy. It's the idea you really just kind of rant and go after uh, something to a point where it's ludicrous, but it's just, it's it, with the timing and presentation, it's just freaking funny. Mm. Big fan of uh, Dennis Leary. I, I used to have the his first album like memorized. Mm. Or it might not have been his first album, but certainly, certainly the one that put him on the map was No Cure for Cancer. Yes. Yeah. And I, I'm with you. I don't know if that was his first album. That that was the first one I knew mm. back when comedians used to make albums because they could make money doing that. Um, I don't think they do that anymore. though. No. Yeah. They still do it. They this do it's not, it's not the same way. Like they'll do, they'll, they'll do, they'll do specials. Mm. You know, we, we, we comedy, we uh, stand up comedy. We live in a world where everything is attainable at, like, so <clears throat> the unfortunate truth uh, for the, com- for comedians is it used to be, you would develop an act and you would just tell that almost identical act. Like you, if you watch like Gallagher, like old Gallagher shows, for instance, you can see like five different specials and a good half of the jokes are the same. Mm -hmm. Now he's a prop comedian. So there's, there's that aspect of it. He's going to use the same props. But the point is that there's a great deal of his material. That's the same. Well, back in the sixties and seventies, you could do that because Mm -hmm it wasn't readily available on the internet as soon as you said it. Mm-hmm. Now, nowadays, what comedians have to do is tour with a, a, a set of material and they'll tour with it for a while, hone it, fine tune it, and then they do a special. The moment that they do that special, they can't do that material anymore mm. because it's now available on a special for anyone to go out and, and yeah. watch and listen to and hear. Now they have to develop a whole new routine and there are guys that do it like for years, Louis CK was doing a new special every single year. That is hard to do. Mm. That's a very it's hard. Like, right, it's like doing a, a novel every year um, yeah. with the tour. <laughs> yeah. And there's, so, there's some comedians that can do it. You know, Carlin did it for years, you know, and he's uh, was obviously an absolute master mm. in the craft. Um, but we're getting a little, far off here so the next that, so the ranter is the first one you have up here and again we're doing char- the comedy characters here the next one you have is the fool mm-hmm. um this would be like your classic jester but do you have an example uh outside of any of shakespearean's work um <laughs> outside of like yurik <laughs> yeah uh I, I you know essentially and a fool jester is more than just a fool jester they have to bring a truth beyond the scope of what the characters understand um, a char- the rest of the characters in the story or, or yeah. that specific character? Uh, the, uh, the characters in the story. You know, uh, the Jester character speaks to the truth beyond the story itself. So he's really speaking to the audience. Um, and, and, but he's doing it in a foolish way that typically the characters don't understand but helps lead the audience down the path where you're going. So did the, was the jester used as a tool, kind of like a, um, a a fifth wall breaker that the rest of the characters in the play didn't understand, but the... but The, the audience jester, should, yeah. The, the audience should, definitely, and certainly the writer, but did mm-hmm. the jester... Was the jester self-aware? Uh, I, I don't think that was necessarily true, but I think a lot of times, you know, it was, it was kind of like a wizard style of character mm-hmm. as a jester. Uh, okay. I don't think that was always true. I'm not. I think that's kind of how it started. But as it went on, I think that that deviated pretty early to where the jester himself might not know. Um, you know, but this was very popular, especially back in, with Shakespearean style work. Um, but up until I, I'd say relatively recently, you know, I mean, uh, you'd have a jester style character in a lot of tragedy. Hmm. Now the next, the next one you have here is the straight man. Which... And there's t- tons of variations. And Michael was kind of talking about one. I say with a comedian, but the comedian might not be a person. It could be a situation where 
the person being straight in and of itself is funny. Mm. Um, but uh, typically, uh, a straight man, you know, I, I think a lot of Abbott Costello with that. Well, immediately. I, I mean, I think that was... I don't know. I, I don't know if they developed the straight man or if they just personified it perfectly. Yeah. Um, any Jason Bateman role. Yeah. Jason Bateman does that really well. Yeah. Jason Bateman is an amazing straight man. Um, but he's also, he's also, he's, he can pull off really silly while giving a straight delivery. So he kind of covers both, which is kind of amazing. Like his performances yeah. are very special that way. Yeah. He, um, he could be a comedian who's just as delivering. Uh, and I can't remember. There was a, a comedian years ago who did all dry humor, mm. but he, I uh, like just talked you, about him. Are you talking about Stephen Wright? Stephen Wright. Yes. Yeah. You know, and, but it was, it was delivering the most ridiculous stuff, but I wouldn't uh, call that straight man. I think no, 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 no. He was a comedian okay. who delivered straight. Um, or maybe even too straight. But well, dry. There's a difference between dry yes. and there's a difference between dry and straight. And we, we, we let's let's definitely Jason Bateman is very he can be extremely dry, but he also knows how how to be straight. And the mm-hmm. basic gist about a straight man, if you're not familiar with these terms, if you have uh, characters that are silly, a lot of times you're going to see the straight man juxtaposed mm-hmm. against a very funny character, i.e., the fool or, you know, some other type of more extreme and obviously comedic character. Mm -hmm. Whereas the straight man takes everything seriously and Mm -hmm. just plays it straight. And like, he doesn't see the humor. in the Exactly. And, and with that, that juxtaposition, that, that difference between those two characters elevates the Mm -hmm. comedy that comes from like, it can take things that he says, like, so a lot of the things the straight man says might not be funny at all. But mm-hmm. because he says it right after something said by the silly character, it becomes mm-hmm. hilarious. You know, if you're thinking like traditional, like trope, uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons sort of uh, fantasy where you have the the paladins and the, the thieves and stuff like that, you know, your paladins or clerics would tend to be in the straight typically, man category. Typically, yeah. yeah. The, um, over, the overly serious, always vowing things. Yeah. Uh, the next one I have here is the comedian. Um, and by this, I mean the clown, um, you know, and so uh, the Joker, the, n- 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 well, <laughs> no, what would the joke, what would the Joker be as a, uh, as a, com- <sighs> I, I guess it would depend on which incarnation of him you saw. That's fair. That's uh, fair. You know, typically sometimes it was the fool. Sometimes it was the comedian. Sometimes mm-hmm. it was a ranter. Um, that's true. That's I'd true. say the dark Knight. he was definitely a ranter. Mm. Um, but uh, the comedian uh, is, is someone who's always making light of any circumstance you're in. And, um, and you always, like, every military World War II movie I ever saw had one of these characters in it. Mm. Um, I don't know about the more modern war movies. I haven't seen all of them. Um, and they don't typically try and do the dynamic quite as much as they used to do in the World War II stuff, which was typically a lot more about the dynamic between the characters in a platoon. Where now it's more about the situation that they're they're, they're focusing on. Um, so I I don't think you know in modern war movies it's necessarily true, but in all old war movies there was always a, a Joker guy, you know, um, even even made fun of in the movie Full Metal Jacket, mm. uh, where, where he was calling him uh, jo- one of the the lead character was called Joker. Yeah, he was called he, Joker. He was making light of every uh, situation that they were in and basic training. So. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 a very important character, and especially this is the character who, who, who just has to say the joke at the wrong time. You know, it's like he'll make light situations better, but he'll make dark situations too light, typically for at least some of the other characters, if not most or all of them. Um, and the next one, I have a not funny comedian, which I do mean dry here. Um, you know, which is the idea of the delivery is not funny, but it could be some of the most funny stuff depending on delivery. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of a performance. I mean, obviously, Stephen Wright is a reference, but I'm um, mm-hmm. trying to think of like a, a character in a movie or something that would be a good example of this. Yeah. Well, the problem is once I get to the first one, I my, my, my search abilities stop. So, um, but that's definitely who I think about here. And then I do think uh, probably the most uh, common type of 
comedic character you see are a bunch of other tropes. You know, the stereotyped characters, the dumb jock, um, the dumb jock bully, if you're in the 80s movies, um, uh, the ditzy blonde. Um, uh, some are really, at this point, bad, like a minstrel character or something like that would be truly an offensive thing to use. Um, or, uh, but, um, you know, but this is once again attacking what users know. And so uh, stereotypes are typically a spot that are ripe for um, uh, comedy. And throughout the ages, and even today still get used, it, it just maybe in a, a more limited number of stereotypes are allowed today than were 30 years ago. And some of it's really good that we've gotten rid of. So, <clears throat> Yeah, and a lot of these are things that have, have developed. We're talking, none of this stuff is new. I mean, this stuff is like old, old, old from like, you know, real old writing to all the way up into vaude vaudeville. You know, like a lot of this stuff definitely you know, um, evolved a great deal when vaudeville came around. You know, I mean, there's a lot you can think of too, sort of like, like, you know, uh, the grumpy man, you know, the grumpy old man, the, the crotchety old man is a very old comedy trope. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there are so many different types of comedy tropes. It's ridiculous. Um, you know, I, I don't think you could even really list them all because there's so many like subtle variations along the way too. So, uh, but I think those are some of the basic ones that you do see a lot. Um, I know are there any of those you can think about there. Any other sort of basic types of comedy characters? Um, I'm trying to think. We've got the rancher, the fool, the straight man, the comedian, the not the, the dry delivery stereotypes. Um, I mean, stereotypes makes me think of a bunch of stereotypes that I don't need yeah. to get, in, get into those type of characters. You're just talking like basic versions. Um, would you say like the fish out of water is just a straight man? It could be, but it, to me, a fish out of water doesn't necessarily have to even be comedy. I don't. That's think true. That. That's true. But I mean, that's obviously one that gets used a lot in comedy. Uh, one of my favorite TV shows growing up was McCloud, which was a a cowboy detective in New York and New York City, New York uh, City, uh, which led to ha ha hilarious moments. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen the show in years, so it might have been really bad, but I enjoyed it a lot when I was a kid, which could say something about it. I don't know. It would definitely be dated at this point, if nothing else. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, like I said, there there, there are, and literally, if you go to uh, the show notes for episode 257, there'll be a link to TV Tropes where they have a lot of these, because literally, you could go over each of these in an episode all, all to their own. Uh, sort of like going over uh, fantasy genres in episodes. So, um, but uh, you know, I think one of the, the biggest thing to remember is it's it's about execution. Mm, definitely, you know, because comedy really is no different. It's about how you execute the sequence of events, uh, the timing of when something happens. Um, you know, that's where you know you have, you know, uh, you know. A, a scene that's meant to be big and impactful that turns funny, uh, which coming to my mind is, do you, did you ever see the movie Broken Arrow? Uh, yes. And uh, it's, it's sort of meant to be a kind of an over-the-top American action uh, mm. romp. And at the very end, um, when uh, they kill, um, uh, uh, spoiler warning. Yeah, for, for, for a 20-year-old movie. <clears throat> for a 20 year old movie they kill john travolta's character he gets shot see you could have just said they they kill the bad guy now they know exactly you know what's happening if you watch the movie for five minutes and you don't know who the bad guy is you're missing it uh, you're not really watching yeah but spoilers he starts off as a good guy don't forget <laughs> but he gets shot essentially by a nuclear missile uh you know literally i guess a nuclear missile and um and it's like he watches it coming at him and almost like this really strange thing where he's kind of like trying to snort it off. It it came across really funny to me. Yeah, it it and was it, yeah. It I, was very I, funny. I believe they I'm hoping they attended it that way. Um because it's one of those things where it was kind of out of place, but it I don't know, I thought that made the movie better because it really wasn't a great movie anyway. Mm. Um 
Um, there's uh, something that I want to talk a little bit about. You, I know you still have a few more things on the list yeah. here, but we've been talking about like different types and, and different comedy aspects. We haven't talked mm-hmm. a whole lot of like when you when you actually make the character and what to do. One of the things that I like to do with silly characters is just to give them unexpected things mm-hmm. and have them do some unexpected things, even if those mm-hmm. things are mundane. If they're unexpected or they're ill timed, mm-hmm. I I think well, that. that- I think, yeah. <clears throat> right. The ing- in, 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 what would you say? How do you say it? Incongruity. Um, so we had a campaign that we did and we had all these characters that were uh, forced together and were in literally in a war zone. They were in a war torn city that was being sieged by a foreign faction. And I had this like little old man character who walked around with a bag and every time he reached, and this bag looked relatively empty. It didn't look like he had a whole, it was like a, it was like a, you know, a, a medium sized sack, you know, like just like a potato sack. And every time he reached into it, it made the sound like he was rummaging, rummaging around through a bunch of pots and pans <laughs> every time. Like it looked like he might've had a couple of shoes and maybe, maybe a, a piece of bread and maybe some cloth in it. It didn't look or move or sound when he walked around with it. Like there was any metal or anything large, but every time he reached into this bag, it sounded like he was tipping over, you know, a, a shelf full of, of tin cans or, or, or he was just shifting through the pots and pans drawer in the kitchen. It's actually and, a cursed thief's item. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it was cursed. It was, uh, it was a bag of holding and I made it a point because I, because I played the character very funny. The character also had um, a familiar. He had a hawk familiar and he would every now and then he'd like lift his arm up expecting a hawk to come land. And then he'd realize that he's not wearing the glove. So he'd pull the glove out, put the glove on, and then he put his arm up. And everyone's standing around waiting for something to her to occur. And I I don't remember 100%, but the hawk may have never landed. I don't know if he, if he ever actually had the hawk land or if he even had one to begin with. But just things like that. Like, none of those actions are, are, are particularly noteworthy. But when we're hiding in an alley from an armada of guys that are right down the road and this dude starts reaching in his bag and making a bunch of pots and pan sounds when everyone's trying to be quiet, you know, <clears throat> that's the built tension and then release tension, you know? Uh, well, in some cases it raised the tension. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Shut up. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, no, I, I, I had an actual, uh, uh, and one of my comedy characters was uh, a sort of corporate fat cat CEO and, space alien who was kind of on the lamb so he was hiding in a ship's crew and okay a really really smart guy brilliant guy uh oh i know what you're talking about i didn't yes. think i knew what you're talking you know about but saying? i i forgot this character was a fat cat though i forgot he was rich oh yeah well he was on the lamb he just wasn't very good and so the thing is they'd sit there and he would come up with all these machinations and these brilliant plans and all those things and then like you know there would inevitably be a button he needed to push you know, to execute it. And, and, and then they'd just all be waiting. Someone would be like, no, 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 no. You have to push the button. Oh, yes. Because he wasn't used to doing anything for himself. So that was sort of the comedy of that character. So, um, you know, but, you know, you know, it's about the context, you know, but really, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, I, I think repeating moments too along the way, you know, sm- like whether it be the pots and pans or, mm-hmm. Or something like that, where they can kind of come up at sometimes inconvenient or sometimes funny moments, or like like meant to be funny moments, uh, where people are expecting it. And sometimes they, you give it to them when they expect it, and sometimes you hold it back when they expect it, and sometimes you give it when they don't expect it. And and it also immediately creates an opportunity for other characters to springboard off of that funny character yeah. or or funny things they do, like with the pots and pans thing. You know, we could be in an alley and, you know, in that exact moment where he's already done this pots and pans move a number of times. Right. Mm -hmm. And someone needs an item. And he's like, he could be like, oh, I have an item. And he lifts up his bag and they immediately grab his hands to prevent him from reaching into the bag. (laughs) No, no, no. That's okay. So then the pots and pans thing doesn't actually occur. But the humor of it is still there because yep. now you're telling the punchline. Because you have established it. Right. You're 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 stating the punchline without stating the punchline. Yeah. And, and, you know, because kind of going back, you know, it's like comedy is part of life. So it, it, it is the same types of stuff that would happen in any dramatic moment. To uh, 
further uh, exemplify that point, um, Monty Python did uh, stage performances of their flying circus uh, sketches. And uh, the dead parrots, they did one, they did a live performance where, um, was it Michael Palin and uh, John Cleese who did the parrot sketch? Yes. So they come out on stage and, you know. I'm sorry, it's Eric Idle. It's Eric Idle. Okay. So they come out on stage and the audience erupts, just, just erupts. Everybody in the audience knows exactly what's going to happen. Now, I don't know if they planned on doing this or if it was just their comedy genius, because they're that smart. Every one of those men in Monty Python are absolutely- Especially at that point, they were so veteran at what they did, yeah. True. So he comes out and he's like, you know, I bought this parrot uh, at this very boutique, you know, and everyone's laughing already because they know what it is. And he's like, and it's dead. And everyone is just dying. And Eric Idle, or did you say it was- No, it is Michael Palin. It is. And and, and, I'm mixing it up, I think. and, And Michael Palin says- well, then I guess I should replace it then. <laughs> Just skip the whole... And they skipped the entire <laughs> bit. They skipped the entire sketch. Which probably got more laughter Which because got, people weren't expecting it. Yep. Exactly. So every... Because mm-hmm. everybody... Like, they could have gone through the whole bit and people would have laughed, but they all mm-hmm. knew it already. So there was no need. Like, we could just move on with the show and <laughs> to other things. And doing that allowed them to imply all that humor without mm-hmm. actually executing it. Yeah. Be- because they already had the, the benefit of... You know, knowing your audience, uh, mm-hmm. good. You, you know, like they 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 already have the joke. So, yeah, you know, and you know, you know, the next thing is you know to kind of keep in mind though, when you're doing comedy, you know, we talk about a lot. It's about timing. It's about people's expectations and what they know. You know, all of those things. You know, you know things that are just a little bit out of place. The way you present something uh, compared to a different way you could present it. You know that's kind of where comedy lives. But when you want to go over the top, you just push it, you know, like, like a a good entrepreneur, you 10 X it, you know, you 10 X your revenue goals. And you you know, it's like when you push it too far, you get to a naked gun or you get to a uh, airplane by just pushing the joke too far. And then when you keep, keep, keep pushing it. If you're not familiar, those are, those are, uh, movies the movie the movie, movie the movie airplane the movie the naked gun and actually how did we not remember uh leslie nielsen leslie nielsen is one of the all-time greatest straight men yes and, and the irony is you know he, he came from a dramatic um background you know he was a character actor always played very serious characters typically in you know like he'd be in columbo or shows like that mm-hmm, where show mm-hmm. up and then when he made a name for himself, though, was doing the straight man, or actually kind of dumb guy humor to a degree where that's I, I think the straight man further. I think dumb. where I think yeah. where it really started was um, a Police Squad, which yes. was a, which was the TV show that kind of springboarded a lot of those movies, um, mm-hmm. and and it was the precursor to na- to the Naked Gun series. Um, and I think they even make reference to that in the first one. Uh, the thing, uh, the, and and he was also special in that he did say and do incredibly silly things, mm-hmm. but almost never play all. When he did the comedic characters, he almost never did a character that responded to his own comedy yeah. in a funny way. He was almost always saying or doing something absolutely ridiculous, especially as, as in, serious as serious, can but be. as serious as can be, which made it so funny. Mm-hmm. Now in, uh, in dead and loving it, he did respond to his, his humor in humorous way. So he did act more, more silly in that movie. And that one's also considered a classic. I don't necessarily mm-hmm. agree, but people yeah, do love that. Movie. I, 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 I would say that was past the prime of many great comedians. Uh, <laughs> in my opinion but uh you know you know you know it's really it's just how willing are you are are you to push it you know and i don't know for drama sake i don't know if very silly is necessarily a good comedic relief outside of a moment or two Mm. Uh, you know i I think that works better in comedy uh but sometimes an over-the-top moment or an over-the-top character can actually really help propel because it will really release the tension the only thing you have to remember is i think it's a lot harder especially if you're writing it to come up with comedy that people will respond to when they read it, you know? So, Mm. uh, you know, it's going to take a lot more work to make sure people are getting the jokes. Mm. Um, you know, where the humor of life doesn't necessarily have to be kind of caught by people. Um, 
But when you start going over the top and, and bigger, you really have to, I think, spend a lot more time working with beta readers if you're writing uh, to make sure that the delivery is actually working. Uh, you know, that they're, they're catching your over the top humor jokes. So um, I, I do think it's probably more difficult if you're novel writing, which impresses me when people are really great at doing that, though. So uh, that could just be my limitation. <laughs> Okay. So now, Michael, give us a world-building task of the day. Um, I think that they should create a really silly killer, a, a silly, a kind of silly, or a very silly character for whatever fiction they're working on. It could be a short story. You could just do a little side. Take your lead character and have them meet this silly character. So you don't necessarily have to, you know, install it in whatever work you're working on. But just play with some humor. Mm -hmm. Like humor is such a like. There's a reason it is a gigantic industry. It it yeah. it it speaks to people on a very primal level. It's something that um, laughter is the best medicine. You know, like we all love to laugh. And if you, you know? if you think your work is so serious that you don't have a place for humor in your work, it's not going to work. It won't work the way you want it to. Um, Humor should be sprinkled. It's a see. It's like eating a meal without salt. Mm. You know, uh, it, it's going to be bland because there's something missing that people expect in life. Uh, so, you know, because sometimes our lives are like jokes. Well, I know. I know yours has been a joke for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, how about a, how about a real world task? So the real world task is okay. I'm coming out with something new in January gonna start on the first but only for people who sign up on a special list on go to howtoworldbuild.com slash sue there's gonna be a countdown timer ignore it that's gonna be saying when it's gonna happen but i'm getting ready to come out with something new if you want to know what it is you're gonna to have to be on this list that's where you find out first and so go to howtoworldbuild.com slash sue and we'll see you next week next week guys next week for something completely different and now for something completely different. It's. Thank you so much for listening to the World Builders Anvil. We would love it if you would share the World Builders Anvil with two of your friends. And so would they. If they are unfamiliar with podcasts, then you get to introduce them to the wonderful world of podcasting. Take them to Stitcher or iTunes, or best of all, just send them to our website, www.gardul.com. That's G A R D U L.com. Now strike while the myth was hot.